Well, we have some good information to cover, guys, and we wanted to talk a lot about uh, alignment in your life in general today because persuaders who are out of alignment in the various aspects of life are not very effective persuaders, and we wanted to kick that off with an article that Kurt has ready to go. And we're ready for a, another geeky article moment brought to you by Kurt. Thank you for that. And it's true, alignment's important for not only as persuaders, but the people you're talking to. Because if they're out of alignment, they're more difficult to persuade. And I like to kind of put it in a, the analogy of a wheel. When something's out of whack, you just can't go very fast. You can't accomplish more. And that's interesting thing I saw with this article about religion and spirituality. And they define those differently. They have dual roles in better health. There's a lot of studies on religion or spirituality. And this was done at Oregon State University. They were looking at the relationship between health, religion, and spirituality. And... It's interesting that they found that religion, this is organized religion, helps regulate behavior and health habits, while spirituality is something you do on your own, regulates your emotions or how you feel. That's what Carolyn Aldwin said. She's a PhD of gerontology. And I had to think about that one for a second because we've always heard geriatrics, but yeah, this one's yeah. a little bit different. Geriatrics is actually studies medical conditions with the aging, and gerontology is the study that incorporates biology, psychology, and sociology in aging. So I learned something. I had to kind of think that one through a little bit, but that is an important piece as far as that's concerned. But this is what they found out, is that religiousness, and that's formal religions, going to service, is associated with better health habits, like lower smoking rates, reduced alcohol consumption, well, spirituality, which they included as meditation and private prayer, helps regulate emotion, which aids to physiological effects like blood pressure and a few other things. And this was in the Journal of Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. And it was just interesting how they separated religion and spirituality. But we've always known, study after study shows, that when you take time to think about those things or to be alone with your thoughts, what happens is it does increase your health and your balance and does make you a better person and a better persuader. That's true. I mean, you think about when you've been working really hard. I've been in the middle of one of those spells where I worked for about two weeks and didn't really take any time off. It just was a lot coming at me. And I was pretty cranky <laughs> at the end of that spell because I didn't just have any time to really sit and be still and think and plan and and gain any perspective. It was my head down in the trenches, and that doesn't make for a very happy lifestyle if you go for too long doing that. And that's exactly right. We have to have that balance or that life alignment in our life to where we're taking care of these little things. Now, we're not going to spend as much time on our spirituality as we are earning income, but we still have to take time to our align ourselves. Because listeners, if you ever had a time when you're feeling out of whack, something's not quite right, you're not feeling the energy, the motivation, the things you need, it's usually because one of these areas in your life is out of whack. You've forgotten about it. You're not spending enough time on it or you're not doing something the right way. So what are some things that the average persuader can do to, to get some better life alignment? Because when you're in sales, for the most part, it can be kind of cutthroat, right? The boss wants to drive you. You got to get out there. You're always on the hunt for more sales. It's kind of a grind. How do you keep that alignment in place? Well, first of all, it's being aware that you're out of alignment, instead of being grumpy and ornery and irritable to everybody, be realize that, okay, something's wrong, something's out of whack, and realize what are those six areas. We can talk about those, but realize life alignment in a lot of ways, I consider it to be not only like a, a tire that's out of alignment, but almost like a mutual fund. A mutual fund is stocks, you know, it reduces the risk. If we have one really weak area in your life, and that's part of your mutual fund, it's going to pull down the value. And that's true with life alignment. If you have one weak area, it affects everything else. You have to realize that having this alignment is going to increase your speed to wealth, increase your speed to success, and make you a better persuader. So you would take some active steps. For example, if I was a mutual fund manager and I had a, a group of stocks that I was buying as a part of the fund, at some point I'm going to look at, hey, do I really want J.C. Penny in here? <laughs> okay, it's a drag, <laughs> right? It's going down, or, or Sears or something like that. Does I'm not a stock expert, but I've been seeing in the news lately, I could be out of date that these are not doing great. So you've got to get rid of those or you've got to turn the management around. So you can't get rid of a certain part of your life, right? If you're really struggling physically, right? Maybe you're overweight, you're not eating well, those kinds of things. I mean, you can't just not do it at all. So how do you fix the broken areas and get them aligned? 
Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about those six areas. And, and the key here is just being aware, not only in your own life, but in the people around you, maybe in your the workplace or your family, when things aren't aligned, people are quick to anger. There's frustration. There's resentment. A lot of those things to happen. The first one is financial, right? That's one. And we know that when you can't pay your bills, it affects every aspect of your life, from your relationships to your health, to the way you think, to the way you sleep. So it's important. If you can't pay the bills, if you're having a challenge financially, you need to spend some time maybe looking at other avenues, maybe looking for a different job, doing better at your own job, having a home-based business on the side. There are different ways to do that, but financial is a big one. That's where we spend a lot of our time. Now we also have to think the next one is intellectual, your personal development program. A Harvard study shows that those who are learning and growing every day, they're more optimistic about life. They're more enthusiastic about where they're going, what they're going to accomplish. But those who aren't learning and growing every day become very negative, pessimistic, doubtful about themselves and their future. So there's something about reading the books, listening to the audios, coming to these podcasts. Pat yourself on the back for doing that. There's something about our brain and how it makes me feel. We need to be learning and growing every day. Not only does it help you make more money, but it also helps you in your health and in your balance. And realize this, that most homes worth over a million dollars have a library. So there is a direct correlation between your success, your income, and your personal development program. Whether it's a podcast or a seminar or a webinar or an audio or a book, or I would say all of the above, just don't get stuck in the trap to say, well, I'll figure it out on my own. Right. And it's never been easier to do that. Right. I have an audible.com app on my iPhone and I have the subscription and I get a couple of books every month and I'm always just uh, consuming those. And I've noticed when I go through prolonged periods where I'm not learning and growing, where I'm not making a conscious effort to take, even if it's just 10 to 15 minutes out of my day to do that, then yeah, you do get in this lull. You become a little bit more pessimistic. But when your brain is receiving that stimulus and growing and everything is fired up, you do so much better. You're so much more confident and, and aggressive in in your life. It's a definite difference I've noticed. Yeah, I mean, just think about it. even driving in the car stuck in traffic. You could be learning something. If you're listening to the news, that makes you tense, ornery, and irritable. But you can just learn and grow a little bit every day. It makes a huge, huge difference. Absolutely. What's the next one? So we've talked about financial and intellectual. The next one is the one we brought up earlier with the article is spiritual. Now, this is important. Now, you're going to spend a lot more time earning money than you are in your spirituality, but this is something you can't neglect. 95% of the people in the world believe in a higher power. There's something about spirituality or religion. You decide. I'm not going to tell you what it is for you. Maybe it is an organized religion. Maybe it's getting back to nature. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's just taking time to be alone with your thoughts. You need to decide what this means to you. But for everybody, it could mean serving or giving back to others. That's part of our spirituality. That's part of who we are. If you're always depressed and things are going right, go out and help somebody out. Help them move. Go to a soup kitchen. Go to a hospital. That will change you more than anything you can do. And that's something anybody can do, regardless of what you believe about religion or spirituality. Helping others, serving others, giving back makes a huge difference in how you feel about yourself. And I define that as far as your spirituality. Again, whether it's a religion, whatever it is, however you want to define it, you need to spend some time to be alone with your thoughts, to meditate, whatever works for you, because spirituality is part of your life alignment. Like you said, Kurt, whatever your persuasion or lack thereof is on the spiritual or, or religious level, there just seems to be some wiring in place inside of the human brain that allows us to have some satisfaction and, and fulfillment of a sense of purpose when we do something for somebody else, uh, however small it may be. I think you've got to be a pretty heartless person to do something for somebody else and not feel anything, not feel any kind of sense of accomplishment or a good feeling. Absolutely. And listen, if you're having a tough time, sometimes we're so focused on ourselves and our problems and why me, it's got to get better, that if we just take the time to go for a walk in nature, go help somebody out, even just to compliment somebody or, or say thank you for something somebody did for you, it does more for you than it does for them. Absolutely. And I've done that before. If you have a period of time in your life where you're not feeling great about things, just make it a, a small and simple goal to once a day give somebody a genuine compliment where you don't expect anything back in return. Because we have these compliments that we hear that are fishing, right? Where people are complimenting because they really want something back. <laughs> and that happens all the time, but it's so blatantly obvious when people do it. 
And so it's so refreshing when it's a genuine compliment. We almost don't know what to do. And that's why we feel like we have to give one back. But just do it without expecting to give one back. And conversely, too, when somebody compliments you, don't try to give some kind of an artificial compliment back to them. Learn how to have the dignity to just say, well, thanks. That's very nice of you to say. I appreciate that. And it just makes everybody feel better all around. Yeah, if you discount the compliment, you discount them. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was very nice of you. And if you spend the time to look for little things you can do to open up a door or that compliment or help someone with their groceries, you'd be amazed when you're looking how often you're going to see these little things you can do. But if you're not looking, you'll never see them. True, true. Okay, so we've covered financial, we've covered spiritual. We did another one. What am I missing here? <laughs> Intellectual. <laughs> Intellectual. Thank oh, you for that. <laughs> that's kind of ironic. Uh, well, that I forgot the intellectual. Yeah, I won't one. say anything. There's a few zingers there, but I'll there's just plenty of zingers. Nice. Uh, listeners, you can go ahead and send your zingers about Steve forgetting the intellectual component uh, <laughs> to the email address here. But let's go to number four, Kurt. Assuming I know how to count. There we go. This one is physical. You don't feel well. It affects your relationships. It affects your ability to earn money. It affects your, your willingness to learn. There's just something about physical. We need to have a health plan. There's something about that. You, we need to exercise. Well, I don't have time to exercise. Well, I think you do because when you look at the benefits of exercise, let's see, you live longer, you sleep less, you think better, you have more energy, you radiate more charisma, your life will be more aligned. I don't know what else I can say. I've made the excuse before. You know, I'm just as guilty as anyone else. But man, when I could be consistent with my exercise, it makes a big difference in the way I think. My energy levels, the energy I transmit, it could be a simple thing. Walking around the block. It could be whatever works for you. You not only need to have an exercise plan, you need to have an eating plan. I know we talk a lot about food, but for the most part, we have to eat pretty good. We have to eat healthy. We have to watch what we put in our bodies because if you have no energy, if physically you're not where you need to be, that could be destroying every other aspect of your life. Yeah, yeah. That bone-in ribeye diet isn't something that you <laughs> want to be doing all the time, right? Maybe once a month or whatever. But I don't know who said this, and I'm slaughtering the quote. So I, I'm massacring a quote, and I don't know who the author is, but it's something to the effect of if you don't take time to exercise and be healthy now, your body's going to force you to take time to be sick and diseased later. That's true. And it's something that we can all work on. And we tease about ribeyes and other food. And that's kind of my motivation to work hard because I'll, I'll go run 13 miles if that'll let me have a ribeye. I'm okay with that. I'll yeah. go earn it. But I'm not going to just eat it every day. I, although I'd be tempted to. I could, we'd probably get sick of it after a while. But it's something you can earn and be diverse with your health plan. That is a big one with life alignment. Cool. What's number five? Number five is emotional. Emotions are like gauges in the car. They're telling you what's happening on the inside. And when you bury your emotions, you don't deal with your emotions. You don't know what your emotions are telling you. You don't know what's happening on the inside. Emotions are neither good or bad. Now, emotions on one hand can be addicting, like resentment or depression or anger. When you feel an emotion, it, release, it releases neuropeptides into your body. And for some people, it can be addicting to always be depressed or always to be angry. The key thing here is understand your emotions, deal with your emotions. When you bury your emotions, that's where you're going to see watching TV, becoming workaholics, not dealing with reality, drugs, alcohol, you name it. A lot of that is because we're burying emotions. We don't want to deal with it. We want it to go away. But if these are your gauges of you on the inside, you need to deal with it. You need to understand, for example, that anger is a secondary emotion, meaning what you're really angry about it's not what you're really angry about. The reason you kicked the dog and hurt the dog may not be the real reason. And that's important to understand. And the big picture is when we understand these emotions and what they mean, it really helps us out. And we notice that when people are always offended, always offended, that's actually a sign of emotional immaturity, not dealing with emotions, always being offended, always being frustrated, always being resentful. All these negative emotions can not only suck the life out of you, poison your relationships, but throw your whole life out of alignment. That's really interesting that you say that, that somebody could actually be addicted to being depressed or addicted to being angry. I, I know people like that that would rather be that way than actually make a change. And that's probably right. You're, because the brain actually is more comfortable feeling depressed or, or feeling angry because that's predictable. It's, it's not the unknown. It's something that they know how it feels. 
And so they'd rather just feel that way. The brain will follow the path of least resistance. And if that's the motion that's easiest to fill to justify their life and why things aren't going right, we have to be careful. I mean, even simple things like understanding frustration, which, well, I'm frustrated. Well, what does that mean? Well, frustration comes from an unmet expectation, either spoken or unspoken. And if you don't deal with that, that could quickly turn to anger. But a lot of people just don't realize, okay, I'm feeling this emotion. That's what this means. They just kind of feel it and act on it versus really dealing with those emotions. Because again, they're not good, they're bad. They're there. We deal with them. But when you bury them and pretend they don't exist, that's when dangerous things can happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of thinking out loud here, but that's probably why children who are raised in a bad atmosphere with a lot of anger or a lot of depression, they become adults like that because their brain is programmed that that's how life is and that's what you're supposed to feel early on. Whereas conversely, if they're raised in a good house where they're given a lot of support and a lot of positive reinforcement, that's the kind of adult they turn out to be. Now, granted, they can buck that trend on either side of it, but more often than not, that's how it happens. That's a big part of it. And as parents, we have to be careful with the way we deal with our children's emotions because a lot of times they're coming to us, they're sad, they're crying, and as parents, we say, well, you shouldn't be sad. And they look at us like, well, I am. <laughs> right, right. Right. Well, we say, well, you shouldn't feel this, you shouldn't do this. Like They are feeling that, so we need to deal with that, not bury it and say you don't shouldn't feel that way because they are feeling that way. Whether it's right or wrong, they're feeling that way, and we need to acknowledge it and deal with it from there. Yep, yep. What's number six? Number six is social. We are social creatures, and our greatest happiness and our greatest sorrow is going to come from our relationships. But just because we have bad relationships, bad things happen, maybe it was a divorce, maybe we got taken advantage of, we can't give up and say, well, everyone's bad, everyone's evil. We find our greatest joy in our relationships. We find our ability to earn income in our relationships. We know there's a direct correlation between our relationships and our happiness, our networks and our income. It's huge. We need to have relationships. We need to have that interaction. It's been said you're rarely going to meet a rich hermit, right? Because wealthy people know a lot of people. They have networks and they understand. In fact, you take a murderer in prison, probably a really hardened person, and the worst thing you can do them, the worst punishment is to give them solitary confinement, right? You think right. they would love their own room. <laughs> but no, humans, we can only last maybe two, three days at the most. We start going crazy. We need those relationships, and we can't stop just because we've been hurt or something negative happened. It's happened to all of us, and it does hurt, but... If you're always afraid to get hurt and afraid to get pain and become numb to that, that's also going to numb you to feel that happiness and the, those great relationships. you got to put yourself out there, but your relationships, your networks, your interaction with people is a big part of your life alignment and your happiness. It's true. It's true. They're, everywhere you go, people are there, and they're the key to getting what you want. They're the key to having a, a satisfying and fulfilling life the skeptical side of it. And this was always kind of an under undertone of Seinfeld. I don't know if you remember that episode of Seinfeld where Jerry said, people, they're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we all feel that way sometimes. <laughs> and I had an experience like that over the weekend where I just thought, really, do I have to deal with people? I mean, everything would be so easy if they weren't always in the way. But they're there. You're not going to change that. And like you said, you've never met a rich hermit. Right? That, that kind of thing doesn't exist they're a rich hermit, well, they had to go through people to get to that point. And maybe maybe you can have that luxury, all right? If you get good with people, make enough money, then you don't have to deal with them anymore. You can just go be a hermit. But uh, You could go hide, but then you yeah. can't be happy doing that either. You're going to have to pay the people toll first. So that's a very good point about the social side. And I think some people need it more than others. Some people need to socialize more than others. We all feel that sense of satisfaction where you you got to socialize, you got to have a good time, and it wasn't attached to any of these other areas, the financial or the physical or all that. You just got to talk to another person and have a genuinely good conversation. You feel good after that kind of a thing, don't you? Absolutely. And Ian, you're right on. Some people may need more than others, and that's okay. Some people are satisfied maybe with a, their Twitter account or their Facebook account, but still, we need that face-to-face -face interaction not only for our finances, but for our happiness and for that need we have as humans to interact with each other. And it's always kind of a task to balance some of these because some of these, depending on your personality makeup, it's, it's pretty easy. A few minutes every day or a few minutes every week and you've got all you need. And other places take almost all of your time. I know some people, and I won't say, say their names, but 
they're having a pretty tough time in their marriage right now, and it's because the financial is always an issue. I mean, these people, they go out on a date together like once a year. I'm not kidding you. And anybody with a healthy marriage could tell you that's not enough, <laughs> right? That's not going to cut it. And they're always chasing this. They're always trying to fix this financial problem. And it's so counterintuitive for me to say that probably if they would take some time to work on these other areas, that financial side would start to even itself out a little bit. Or am I crazy? No, you're, you're right on. And we do need to spend time with each, but it's not equal time. I mentioned earlier, we're probably spending the majority of our time on financial. And we need to. That's how things are set up. I can hammer out three of them in an hour in the morning. I can start exercising. I'm listening to personal development audios for the intellectual. Then I'll take a few minutes to be alone with my thoughts to think about the day for the spiritual side. I can hammer that out in an hour, right? So it's not a lot of time for each one of these, but we do need to address each one of these every day. And it's just a little bit of time every day. I just got back from having our car serviced, you know, change the oil. And I don't need to change the oil every day, but I need to make it a regular habit to get it done. And if I ignore it, then I've got bigger problems, right? I'm focusing on everything else, and that's what happens. Financial, yeah, it's going to take eight hours of your day, depending on your career. It could be more, it could be less. And, and like you said, a half hour on the treadmill, listening to some personal development, you knocked out two of them. I mean, that's pretty good. And making a conscious effort to address every single one of these in your life, you can have a much more happy and a much more fulfilling life. And chances are, I think if you lined up 10 people and asked them, hey, what one thing would make you just totally happy right now? A lot of that would be financial or a lot of it would be emotional, right? Maybe they've got a problem with a family member or a friend that's just really weighing on them. But if these things were all addressed over time in a very healthy way, I think that one thing that those people said would change or maybe wouldn't be as big of a deal that they really thought. I mean, maybe you had a money problem and you made a bunch of money. Well, chances are a couple of weeks later, you were unhappy again, right? Because really who you are inside and how balanced you are inside makes up for a very, very happy and fulfilling life. You see all the time in the, in the news, celebrities and people who have tons of money. They're getting drunk. They're going to rehab. They're having all kinds of family problems. Clearly, that doesn't solve it. It's being able to be balanced in these other areas. And I, I would tend to think that, yeah, that financial side and some of these others... You don't feel like you're in a crisis all the time. You don't feel like they're that important if you can address these others. I agree. That's right on. And that's important for the listeners to know a couple things. I would choose one of your weakest links. So choose the weakest link and come up with a game plan. How are you going to change that? How are you going to fix that? And also realize as power persuaders that when you're trying to persuade somebody and their life is not in alignment and you can kind of sense what it is, if you can get them back on track – they're going to be easier to influence in the long run, especially if it's a coworker or a member of your family or someone you need to influence in the future. It makes a big difference to be able to identify this, and not only in your own life, but in the lives of others. Absolutely. Absolutely. All good points, and thanks for, thanks for bringing that stuff up. We do the show to give you some good cutting-edge persuasion and influence techniques in your life. And at first glance, this stuff that we talked about today may not be that to a lot of you, but the point is, is if you're going to be sharp, if you're going to use all the techniques that we're always talking about and that you're researching and learning about on your own and your life isn't in alignment, it doesn't matter, right? A car with a bunch of horsepower that has four flat tires, the horsepower is really a moot point, isn't it? Exactly. And in a lot of ways, this is self-persuasion. Because if you can't persuade yourself, you're not good at persuading other people. And your life is not aligned you're not going to feel like it. You're not going to want to do it. Something's not quite right. There's someone to blame. It's a downward spiral. And this makes a big difference in people's success. Yep, it does. Okay, Kurt, it's time to cue up Homer. Don't, don't, don't. There he is. There he is, Homer. The horrible sign for somebody that they are about to be the victim of the persuasion blunder. The name of the blunder this week shall remain anonymous. And as you can tell, I've got the blunder this week. I was walking through some properties in Garden Grove, California over the last couple of days. And if any of you have ever been in real estate or construction, you know that smell when you walk into a property and instantly you go, okay, there's some nasty mold within this property. And we found it. We found it in the corner in one of the bedrooms behind where there was a shower. Obviously, there was a bad shower pan in there and Water had been leaking into the wall and into the subfloor for a long time. There's a bunch of nasty-looking black mold. 
and this particular property was bank owned. And so many times when you have a big issue like that, termites or mold or foundation, the bank will get a report and they'll make it available to people that look at the property because they know everybody's going to be bringing that up. And this is an effort by the bank to kind of get out in front of that and take it away as a negotiation tactic, right? Because you can go, well, your property has mold, so I'm going to offer you, you know, 10 cents or whatever. And so they're trying to say, well, here's what it would cost. They had two reports. One, it was going to cost $5,000 to remove the mold. And the other, it was going to cost $30,000 to remove the mold. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Almost close. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I was joking. I said, I told the realtor, I said, well, are the $30,000 guys, are they going to come in BMWs to take out the mold? What's the difference here? <laughs> right? This is a pretty shocking price difference. So the blunder goes to the bank. Guys, you got to explain what's going on here because this is just, I mean, the, the smell of the mold was bad enough, but the BS was much, much worse. So <laughs> unnamed bank, I think it was Fannie Mae. We'll make fun of Fannie Mae. <laughs> Fannie Mae, you're the blunder of the week. You got to explain this stuff. It's scaring buyers away. A discrepancy like that is just people aren't going to get over it. Neither did I. We did not place a bid on the property. It's just not going to happen. So there's the blunder for the week. And that's true. When you have a, a discrepancy like that, there's going to be some type of explanation where they're going to put it gold in. Or are they going to put a jacuzzi there instead? <laughs> yeah. Or they replace the shower? That's notorious for those type of bids to where... A lot of them can be so different because they don't explain exactly what they're doing and why it's cost that much versus what their competitor's doing. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that the bank's psychology here is we've got a property in Orange County, California. The market is red hot. I'll just put it on there and uh, we'll do what we got to do. And they're thinking that it's just going to sell. And a lot of properties that are in decent condition do sell within 30 days in Orange County right now. Well, this thing had been on the market for like 170 days, which is an eternity, Right. That's a long time in a market like this. And so clearly their strategy is not working. You guys got to take a little bit more of a proactive approach because that mold problem, the discrepancy in the bids is scaring people away. Otherwise, this wouldn't be around for 170 something days. So there's our blunder. And guess what, Kurt? I know you're looking forward to this. Cue the ninja. There it is. There it is. We've got a ninja incoming, and this is actually from a listener. We're going to give a, or give some props to Anas H. We'll use his last name, initial only. Uh, he sent in a email that we wanted to read on the show. So thanks so much, Anas, for listening. And we know that we have at least one listener. <laughs> Just kidding. The <laughs> show's doing quite well right now. We're, we're excited to have everybody listening. But the email says this. Kurt and Steve, first off, let me thank you for the amazing podcast you two put out. I tried to get a couple of my friends to start listening to the podcast. Can't tell you how much your advice has helped me in securing a summer internship. I feel that universities do a great job of teaching you the technical knowledge you need, but they don't stress social skills you need in the workplace. I'm really big on self-improvement, and your podcast mission is aligned with my goals. With that in mind, how might I be able to go out forming a club to help practice public speaking and presentation at college? How can I attract kids to join? There seems to be an erroneous belief held by many students that Cornell, and this is where Anas goes, that because they attend an Ivy League university, they're set. I don't believe that's true. I think a club like this can really help students distinguish themselves from the rest of the brilliant kids who attend the school. Thank you in advance. Yours sincerely, Anas. Now, we'll get to Anas's question here, but the reason I gave him the ninja is because he figured this out at a young age, right? Many people think that. They think I can go to a really great school or because I've got the degree, people are just going to line up to give me jobs. There's a entitlement mentality in the university system in America and in the whole world today. But if you don't have some basic people skills, if you don't know how to talk, if you don't know how to present, it doesn't matter what your degree says. People are going to be a little bit underwhelmed by you. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And I tell my students the same thing where, look, these soft skills are 85% of your success, you need the competence, but that, that opens the door. And that's what a college degree does. College degrees are great. I encourage those, but that gets you in line. That qualifies you for the job. Now, from there, they're looking for people that have the people skills, the persuasion skills, the ability to communicate, the ability to speak in public. That gives people that extra edge on everyone else who has a degree because the degree is a degree, What you need to get you in the door. But then from there, you got to rely on these soft skills to not only get the job, but to keep the job. 
you've got to be able to play some politics. I mean, I hear people complain all the time about, oh, so-and-so, they're incompetent and they're in management it's because they know this guy or they, they just, they know how to grease the skids. Well, learn how to grease the skids then, people, right? <laughs> that's that's the world say, we live in. Well, I don't want to play the game. Well, then you're not going to win. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're going to forfeit, right? <laughs> And an interesting study I saw that with new NBAs going into the workplace, they weren't lasting more than a year or two at their new jobs because they came in. They were the MBA. They have the latest skills, the latest education. You know what? I don't care you've been here for 20 years. You're doing it the wrong way. Have you tried it this way? And they weren't on the same level. They didn't have good people skills. And they eventually had to go find another job someplace else and realize that, hey, you're dealing with humans. You're dealing with people. You're dealing with these type of things that you need to have these soft skills. And it's great. The earlier people can figure this out, the better. Absolutely. And our listener, Anas, is wanting to form a club about this and kind of talk about all these kinds of things with his fellow students and you know you can uh, refer him to the podcast that would be my first recommendation <laughs> <laughs> 10 point ding ding. ding ding but obviously beyond that you know there there are lots of clubs in many cities toastmasters being one of them dedicated to public speaking and and many universities do teach some kind of a public speaking class but if you can get some like-minded students that that like to present that like to sell like to do those kinds of things yeah, you could form some kind of a club like that, but you're going to have to hustle. You're going to have to uh, get people to buy into the concept. So you've got to expose them to some good information initially and just slowly build the ranks from there. You have anything else to, to tell on us there, Kurt? Yeah, I'm sure the university has some resources. There's the public speaking side. There's the Toastmasters you mentioned. A lot of universities have a club. There's the National Speakers Association if you're looking to really hone in and rub shoulders with people who speak for a living. That's something that you can take a look at. Entrepreneurial type clubs are really good to join because they realize that you can have a great product, but you need to have a lot of these soft skills. And so they spend more time learning these soft skills. So there might be some already happening that you can join or you know, figure one out on your own and find those like-minded people. And the great thing about it is you'll develop a mastermind group that will not only help you in college, but I'm sure this could last you a lifetime. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as you become a better speaker and a better persuader, the people who are not totally checked out mentally are going to ask you about it. They're going to want to know, how are you successful? How come you're so good in front of the room? Well, as a matter of fact, I go to this club or I, I attend Toastmasters or whatever it may be. And you're going to start uh, making a difference in people's lives because the sooner that they can real, realize this like you have in us, the better it's going to be for everybody. I agree. Cool. Kurt agrees. Well, I guess that's the end of it. <laughs> I agree. I mean, we can harp on these all day long, but really these these soft skills that's, are so important, that influence, that leadership, that charisma, that your core competence, which you still need, is only 15% of your success. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there you go, guys. Uh, good stuff. And, and we look at that. We see it in, uh, for example, politics. We know that very rarely does the politician with the best ideas and the best core competence win. It's the one who can relate to people and get them to buy in. Now, sometimes it's the same guy. Sometimes the guy with the, the good technical skills also has people skills, but usually it's just a guy who knows how to work the room. <laughs> yeah, sad but true. Sad but true. So that's the world we live in. That's it, everybody, for today. Remember to send your comments, your questions, your suggestions, Anything else to maximize your influence at gmail.com and be sure to subscribe to us on uh, iTunes. Uh, we are on Stitcher and we are on Blackberry, all those uh, different kind of funky places, or you can just go to maximizeyourinfluence.com and listen directly there from the website. And we're always trying to broaden how you can listen to the show and get it out there. So we look forward to hearing from you. Kurt, thanks so much for uh, being on the show with us and we're going to sign off. See you next week. If you're watching us on YouTube, like the video, subscribe to our channel, leave us a comment, let it, share it with your friends, let us know what other tools you want to hear. Persuade with power.